Since the economic crash, Tom Darcy has been through the mill with banks, the courts and agents of the state who seek to enforce the law in recovering 17.5 million borrowed from AIB during the boom years. He told us his story in the summer of 2013 here on Late Lunch and he returns today for a catch up on the publication of his new book, Waiting for the Sheriff. Tom, it's really good to see you again. Jerry, thank you very much for having me on the show and particularly to LMFM for being the only radio station in Ireland since the publication of this book a month ago to actually have me on a radio station at all. This is the very first radio station to take me on. You're more than welcome and I'm really keen to catch up with you because there's been a lot of water under the bridge in two and a half years. Just remind my listeners again uh, about your story. You had a nice home on the south side of Dublin beside Belgrove, was on the north side? North North side, side, sorry, I beg your pardon, beside Belgrove Football Club. Yes. And uh, you were quite happy and content there but they, what, sold that place and you would have had apartments, was it, looking over you? Basically, what happened was, like a, a lot of ha- to a lot of people, development started to occur. One, unfortunately, was adjacent to my family home, so we were either going to sit there in a fishbowl, or we decided to move. Now we had a beautiful home. Uh, I'd worked particularly hard uh, to, to achieve it, and ultimately, my whole family, because my family were quite older than the average at that time, and we decided to move on. Um, we bought an ice site out in Hoat and I was in construction and I decided to build it. Um, there's a lot of the story of what, how it happened, what transpired and a couple of issues in relation to freehold and all of that that's identified in the book. And then ultimately, my wife was a designer and we designed um, a very futuristic looking house and it was renowned as the Glass House in the Hoat area. Um, there was a couple of um, unusual aspects to the house. One, I suppose, was the the May's prison staircase that Bobby Sands was allegedly used to walk on the, the staircase. Um, got a lot of interest. Ultimately, I walked into a bank one day um, to basically get the funding for a, a van. I uh, told him as a proud father about my property, uh, took out the pictures, showed him everything, and I walked out with four and a half million for uh, a new development on the north side of Dublin. Now, hold on a minute. In Just like that, you, you're actually saying to me it happened as you spoke there. As yes. quick as that, no questions, you didn't have to go through bona fides, paperwork, anything like that? No. But when you consider, Jerry, the reality was my fate was doomed on that day. It was nothing whatsoever. It was just like your listeners at home. Their fate was doomed. It nothing whatsoever because the information I, I have actually unearthed throughout these years since I last spoke to you is startling. It was premeditated. It was calculated. It had nothing what to do whatsoever with the capability of your listeners paying their mortgage or the fact that they were buying buy-to-lets or whatever. The whole principle of what the banks were doing was a simple thing called a mortgage back asset security. And I know that sounds complicated and it's all bank jargon, but the reality was that you take an average, one of your average listeners right now who borrowed in 2006 or seven and bought a house in a nice area in Drogheda and they borrowed 300,000. Well, for them, that was th- their goal in life. They wanted to get a secure ha- house for their family. They had a beautiful area to live and have their children educated. But the reality for the bank was that they were going to use that asset as a mortgage-backed security to go onto the Irish stock market and sell it on and then create what's known as derivatives. So they were manipulating the interest attached to that. And everything I'm going to say here today can be quite easily proven. It's anybody that wants to substantiate or try to repudiate what I'm saying, you know, all you have to do is contact us at waitingfortheshariff at gmail.com. Everything's in the book. But again, They went out, they manipulated. We decided to investigate the entire actions of the bank from day one. And this is basically what what it was done in a very simple format. They took the asset uh, security. That's the house, the property itself. It's the folio, it's the registration, uh, uh, the charge on the folio they're basically selling. And they sold that and they created a derivative attached to it. They manipulated the interest. We say to people immediately, particularly to your listeners right now, 
We've had hundreds of people's bank statements checked and every one of them were overcharged by every financial institution in Ireland. Now, it might be rather unique that the ones that we've investigated were overcharged. And I've been given numerous people's names with their permission to name them so people can verify it on Facebook. One gentleman alone, Mick Daniels, he gave me his permission. We have correspondence from the bank accepting overcharging. What do you mean by overcharging? You know, you, you take out a mortgage, you have a monthly repayment at an interest rate. It could be fixed, it could be tracker, it could be variable. Again, what they do is they manipulate the interest in the LIBAR, Unibar rate where you don't see that. What you see is the rate that was affixed and attached at the end of your bank statement. But during the course of the month, that's manipulated and changed and altered. And just like Mick Daniels, he wasn't in debt when I went and I gave I gave seminars since I met you, pro bono, free of charge, going around the entire country. And I say to everybody, have your bank statements forensically analysed. Now, Mick, normal mortgage, 350,000. He was overcharged by 47,000 euros. Over what period of time? Over a period of seven years. And in the latter part, when the, the liquidator took over IBRC, and we all know who the liquidator is, he actually overcharged more in the latter years while he was supposed to be sanitising our questionable banks and their etiquettes, um, Mick Daniels was overcharged more at that period. Now, that made one of the, the local newspapers. Unfortunately, it never made national newspapers. And when we got confirmation from the bank apologising for the overcharging, like €47,000. is massive. Incredible. And did he not see this in terms of, you know, I say to you again, he has repayments. You get letters from them, Tom, telling you whether they go up or down with interest rates or whatever. Are you saying that that 47,000 appeared on his statement? If he saw that on his statement as repayments changing, changing, surely he'd challenge it. He wouldn't see it because it was stealthily done. It was behind the scenes. It was what you might see. Another analogy could be given that if we are affixed into a 3% mortgage rate, but then the next day, uh, somebody could quite easily raise it to 3.2% and carry that for a month until your next statement comes out. There's numerous ways of manipulating interest. Of course, your listeners went in trusting. I always take a box of Nurofen with me. Why? Because it's the perfect analogy to explain to your, to your listeners. When you walk in to buy a box of Nurofen, you're given this long questionable arguments about do you know what you're doing? That's and right, is it I've going experienced to, it myself. Right. The reason being because you're supposed to have informed consent. Massive difference to buying a box of anodin or paracetamol. With Nurofen, you have to know what you're doing. When you buy that box of Nurofen, you believe that the person is licensed, regulated, um, they're trustworthy, all the tests have been examined and all of that. The reality with our banks back pre-boom was that they weren't telling the truth to our listeners. What they were, what they didn't say, and I managed when I ran as an MEP, and we'll probably go over that uh, on RT, was that our banks were insolvent. They were bankrupt. They were trading illegally. They had no banking licences. Now, everything I'm saying here today has been drafted an affidavit in the Irish courts for the last five years, and it's on public record. I've raised this in every court. I was even directed by Judge Elizabeth Dunn to actually go to Angarda Siakana, and that's where we last met. I had gone to Angarda Siakana and established a criminal investigation against the banks. And since I, I met with you, that was at a time when I was fighting the banking system as a lay litigant in person, facing into the Supreme Court, never thinking for one second that an individual like myself could take on the establishment and actually win back my home. And I became the only person in the state you did so. that because you were here in the summer and it was later that year you actually won. You had been 46 times in the court with no success. Now, anyone else would just pack their tent up, Tom Darcy, and go home. But you went back 47 to the Supreme Court and you won. But let me ask you this. I want two things. Just come back to the debt. You, you got that four point something million the first day you walked into AIB and out of it. How did it end up at 17 and a half million? Just quickly. Basically, what I'd done was we established, we purchased two sites in Mora Manor. Um, and this had nothing whatsoever got to do with my family home. 
There was no documentation signed in relation to my family home uh, by my wife. And then a new site came up in Haute. It was rezoned from agricultural to unrestricted, unrestricted residential use, uh, which gave the opportunity uh, to build anything basically you wanted within a certain level or height. And I mentioned that to the same bank manager. An amazing site came up. There's a figure of 10 million on it. God, I'd love to build Ireland's first designer village, but maybe in time. And literally, I walked out of that bank again with 10 million euros. But Tom, people are listening today and they hear what you're saying. And they said, Tom, did you lose the run of yourself? Did you not realise that you were getting into the stratosphere here with money? As you knowingly and willingly took that money. But how, if the conditions of any contract says that you must make full repayment or refinance. And when you read the conditions and you know that those conditions are in the control of the bank solely, they had to make full... I had to make full payment by the completion of that development. It was, according to the bank manager, a no-brainer. There was no risk. So tell me this. If the boom... We're talking about 2005, around that time, wasn't it? Those are the years. And then we all know what happened subsequently, seven, eight... If we'd rattled on with the times that were, that it continued as it was without the crash, would you have got out of this? Could you have paid it back? Would you have been in the clear? I can still do it today, Jerry. Like remembering, and again, because of the lack of media, and I again, I have, I'm really in your debt for taking me, but last year, the Supreme Court, I went to the Supreme Court last year on a motion about an insurance matter on my family home. And the Supreme Court bench turned around and they said, with the amount, now remember, I'm up to 70 times now at this, at this stage in the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal and in High Courts, with the amount of litigation that Mr. Darcy has brought before this bench and the complexity of issues that is presented on a daily basis, with the amount of wealth of knowledge, they were confused and they considered that common sense should prevail here. Now, I was awarded my course in the Supreme Court, and I would like to say that I haven't been paid for it in two years. Now, let me ask this. that The costs are one thing you were awarded. What happened with the 17.5 million? Where is that? You did win your Supreme Court yes. case. You were awarded costs. Yes. But where did that leave the debt? Are the banks still pursuing you for that debt? Well, they pursued me again, and I won them again. And they pursued me for a third time. But just going back to what they said in the Supreme Court, they said common sense must prevail here, Mr. Darcy. So I went to the AIB and I got a financial backer, proof of funds to buy out the entire building portfolio at the bank's own auctioneer's valuation. Which was what? At that time, it was 3.7 million. Down from 17 and a half. half. Yes. Okay. And they refused it and then pursued me again. So one would ask the quick, the very quick question, why would the, the banks pursue you back in court when all they're ever going to get is the open market value that they were offered? Remembering, the bank currently has p- spent roughly about one and a half million illegal fees against me. Um, common sense doesn't prevail when the banks are following you or pursuing you. What they're actually doing is it's a personal vendetta against certain individuals that will frighten, just like, and I know we will mention the O'Donnells, but it was a public spectacle. Now, the reality for me, and I've said it on numerous occasions, I want to go back and develop. I want to pay that loan. But again, and I don't want to lose track of what really happened it was nothing got to do with Tom Darcy, the property developer, or Mrs. McGuinness, who lives down the road, who's buying a mortgage. The banks premeditated. They were dependent on creating a mortgage back asset security that they went along and sold on. Now, remember, when they sold it on, they sold it for more than they were exposed. But they also retained the insurance. They had default insurance, indemnity insurance, personal insurance. Then they also had the interest, which they were manipulating, but they didn't own the loan. So when all of this happened, and by their own actions, and this is what happened in America, when Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac and the Federal Reserve and everything went pear-shaped, our banks claimed the default insurance. 
And as everybody knows, if you have a watch and you insure it with any of the insurance companies and you claim for that watch and you get paid, but if you find a watch later, you can't hold on to the watch. That's a criminal act. Uh, you have to surrender it to your local guard station or give it to the insurance company. But our banks didn't do that. In fact, our banks had multiple insurance policies, indemnity insurance. But on every contract that your listeners will read in their own personal contracts, there's a little thing called redemption. And surely when the loan has been redeemed in whole or part, well, you can't claim the whole loan if somebody else has paid for it. And you certainly then can't go to the Department of Finance and claim that you need to be bailed out on something that you've been paid for twice. Originally, when you securitized it. And secondly, then after when you claimed your insurance. So how was it then that the banks were able to sell it on to a vulture fund for a third time? Not taking into consideration, which would be considered as the fourth time when the taxpayers bailed out the banks. So I consider that all this criminality of the bank, and that's exactly what it is, Jerry. When you falsify your, your financial returns and register in the CRO, the company's registration office, as, a, as a, an honest reflection of your financial records, and then you're, you are, you're unerted to prove or you're being proven that actually that was falsified. It was falsification, it was misrepresentation. The shareholders, the stockholders, the pensioners, People who had life savings in this country were destroyed. But in the book, you will see at the back page of the book, there's actually a C1 registered mortgage document registered in the CRO on the 15th of February 2008, which clearly showed that our banks, all of our banks were insolvent. They were trading illegally. And yet they were loaning by the new time. Stay with us on Late Lunch. Tom Darcy is my special guest. Tom, come back to the point of, of the debt at this stage. How You won in the Supreme Court. This is what I can't get my head around. You won, yet the bank are still pursuing you. Well, there's a little thing called res judicata, which means double jeopardy in, in, in criminal law. And one would consider that common sense should prevail. We should all sit down and say, look, let's work this out. You've already been told by the Supreme Court, the highest court in, the, in Ireland, that, look, you were wrong, but yet they pursued me again. Um, and when they pursued me again, this time they pursued me for a different figure. Originally, it started out at 17 and a half. That was three and a half million with interest. And the bank issued what's known as a new statement to claim, and they claimed 21 million. And when I investigated that 21 million, I found that they were actually overcharging me by 2.2 million. Now I looked at the rest of the interest and realised because we have currently the lowest lending rate in the history of the world, 00.25%. I actually applied that lending rate at a base rate of 2% and found out that the banks are overcharging people, your listeners, over 2,000% interest from what they're actually affixed. That's a higher level than cocaine on the streets of Dublin. And we wonder why the atrocity of austerity is affecting every person. The reality is, is that your listeners have never been told the truth. Not one person has ever... I was on Vincent Brown when I, when I was running as an MEP, and I raised a question, and your listeners can Google it as I'm talking, um, why not one pundit, not one economist, not one TV pro broadcaster has ever asked a question, where did the six billion euros go in the Anglo tapes? It was, they made a reference and no impertinency, but they were, presumably they picked it from a certain part of their anatomy. But what happened to the six billion euros? Nobody ever asked that question. Who had it? How much was generated? So I followed it, even though uh, Vincent Brown uh, repudiated what I said. Uh, the next day, I sent him over a transcript. I proved categorically what I said. But there's certain questions that needed to be asked in this country. And that's the reason why I have investigated what happened, why it happened, who benefited, who's still benefiting, who's suffering. And when we look at their whole, even here locally, you're looking at cuts in HSC across the board. You know, Drogheda Hospital is no longer, it's just a resemblance of what it used to be. And you're looking at the devastation. 
But there's still billions right now, this moment, in, a, in companies down in East Point, Fulcher Funds, the same company directors who were active prior to the bubble bursting, bank managers in the IBRC, AIB, ACC, Ulster Bank, who are now pensioned off by taxpayers' money, who are down there now working, getting thousands, millions again after being pensioned out for breaking the laws of this country. Let me ask you this about your own situation again. Two things. When you won in the Supreme Court, you won on the basis that the banks were operating, you say, illegally. The Supreme Court agreed with you. The Supreme Court ruled that the order of Judge McGovern, and uh, we have to say, and I identified in the book, I mentioned judges' names, who Mm. were indebted in property, some extensively indebted, and some might say that um, surely their impartiality could be questioned if you're indebted to the same banks that are in front of you that you're ruling in favour, and particularly one judge who uh, was so indebted that his own colleagues, barristers and solicitors, were actually uh, standing before him. But the order of Judge McGovern was considered unlawful. Uh, There was a fraudulent piece of documentation presented in that court by the bank at the time, and I identified it immediately, and thereafter they decided, OK, the, the Supreme Court ruled that it was an unlawful order. Was that a technicality you got off on? No, it was fraud. Now, if you were ruled in favour of by the Supreme Court. Here's the next logical question. Why was it just you? Why wouldn't this apply to thousands of others who are in the same boat as you? Well, going back, I raised so many issues. And again, my whole emphasis of why I'm here today and why I wrote a book was about eviction throughout Ireland. Uh, And every day, it's like Schindler's List when I open my internet you hear horrific stories. And this is not being published, it's not being reported. It is the silent uh, victims of this uh, atrocity. And by the way, this atrocity was deliberate. It was man-made. But just before, I'm going to news it too. Answer me that question. Should the ruling have applied to thousands and thousands of others who were in the same boat, who were loaned money at the same time with, with, with what a court says was, n- was wrong? Again, I would have to correct you when you say that the people were lent money. What they were created was a mortgage-backed asset security. They'd never got money. So the point I want to get to is this. Really, if your case and your decision applied to others, it would have meant the whole collapse of this whole thing. What? Well, the issues I raised, and I say it in the book, the issues I raised were never ventilated in the media. And if one of the issues was ever raised, it would have cost in the state 195 billion euros. I want to park it there for two o'clock news. Afterwards, I am going to move on to talk about some of the horrific cases that are in Tom's brand new book. It's called Waiting for the Sheriff. Tom Darcy's with me on late lunch, and I've read his new book over the weekend called Waiting for the Sheriff. God, the image on the front of the little lad Tom there and the face of him being evicted because I I just want to read uh, just a short few lines from the book Um, it begins six weeks later as the new year was in its third week I received a call from Kieran's brother his tone was quiet and sad as he told me how Kieran had been found hanging from a tree his eyes had been pecked by the birds and his clothes were soaked in urine a family picture was found on the ground Having held it tightly, he would have released it as the life left his body. As a result of the mental anguish that was suffered in silence by a man who did nothing wrong. Now that man Kieran contacted you out of the blue. You became an associate of his and he called you as they moved in to take his house away. Yes. And throw him out in the road with his family and children. Is that something that has happened on a regular basis? It happens every week, twice, three times, four times, five times a week, up and down this country. It is, to me, the greatest atrocity that has ever fallen or befallen any family in this country. And sadly, suicide. And I have gone to so many suicide funerals. Um, And still today, it brings me to tears because... There is nothing more tragic than looking at a woman who is facing eviction or has been evicted 
standing at a graveside, wondering how she's going to pay for that funeral, looking at her children, trying to figure out where they're going to stay or sleep tonight. I'm wondering and carrying that question, why? Sadly, and I would actually beg any of your listeners who are feeling in any way depressed in any way whatsoever, remember one thing. You broke no laws, committed no crimes. You're a victim of criminality perpetrated by criminal banks and they broke the laws of this country and yet we're paying for their crimes. Please contact Peter House aware, the Samaritans, but don't, please, please don't take that ultimate step. You've done nothing wrong and there is a way back from all of this. The evictions of this country, uh, why we do we have eviction in this country? Very simply, two years ago when I was here, if you remember, I was challenging the Land and Conveyancing Law Reform Bill. I was asking every TD not to sign the eviction bill. Sadly, 90 of our TDs done something contrary to the constitution of this country, contrary to the, their own oath of office. They signed for eviction in this country. They re-established eviction to evict their own constituency. And was it not consi- here previously? Did that not stand on the books? Were there the, not evictions even prior to the boom bust? There was a lacuna in law created by Judge Elizabeth Dunn in July of 2013 that actually stopped evictions whatsoever across the entire country. But because of Trika and because of the complicity of our government, um, they decided that they had to force through a law to make sure that the banks were going to be able to foreclose on an asset-backed security that they didn't own anymore. But when you consider that 90, 90 TDs voted, like in our in this constituency alone, Peter Fitzpatrick, Jer Nash, Fergus O'Dowd, Regina Doherty voted to evict women and children out of their home. What type of human being votes to evict an innocent woman, innocent children, marred for the rest of their life, and a man who obviously, like myself, who done nothing wrong, broke no laws, are cast on the streets like rubbish. But they will say that what anybody did, like yourself, was borrowed substantial monies from a bank that has to be repaid. So besides all that we've talked about, you do accept the principle that if you borrow, you must repay. Well, if I was given the truth, and if I was told at the very start that, Tom, by the way, this bank is operating illegally, criminally, is insolvent, operating bankrupt, is trading, it doesn't have liquidity, it has no insurance, would any of your listeners have ever borrowed? Would anybody with any intelligence have ever borrowed off somebody who's acting criminally? So you're back to the Neurofin. You're saying again that we didn't know. We didn't get the full picture. Well, as I say with the Neurofin, it's a great analogy, and some of your older listeners will remember just like my vintage, I don't know about your your vintage, but anyway, that when you go in, you buy uh, any medication, you consider that it's regulated, it's licensed, it holds all the requirements and legislation. You don't believe that it's going to cause deformity or it's going to have a fatal issue. But then again, this happened before in 61. It was called thalidomide. And our government knew what, ha- what the procedure was and what was going to happen. And they done nothing. Well, our government knew Seven years ago, their banks were insolvent. They knew they were operating criminally, but they didn't care what was going to be the consequence. Because just like our minister, who is a bond-holding minister, he wasn't going to vote to burn bondholders. He wasn't going to, like, turkeys for Christmas. No, the constituents, the people of this country, the victims every day who are living this day and this night in fear of eviction tomorrow morning. But, Tom, do we... Perception has to be at this stage. We talk about green shoots, the country rattling along, highest, fastest growing economy in the European Union now. It's all over. The boom is back again. There's no issue. The arrangements have been made between the majority of people who are in debt. There's been new arrangements put in place. Is that the truth? No, absolutely not. And let's look closely at what they advocate. They say that the banks are now rejuvenated and are back lending. But new lending, they have reconstructed old mortgages for certain people who are lucky enough to have a job. But those people who are lucky enough to have a job don't have a life. They have a pure existence, living in debt, 
some of their children while they're working are going to school hungry. The reality is, is that when you look closely, and I've looked at hundreds of these mortgages, look at the people who, um, and we won't identify them, who are selling these mortgages. Um, some of them are getting um, benefit from the banks. Actually, there is one or two, and this can be found very easily when you investigate their financial returns, are getting large figures from the banks to promote mortgages. And what do they get when the people sell mortgages? Well, they get a life policy to get a commission from. They get a commission from the bank. And then if these people default, and remember, most if not all, the, the people who found themselves without a job didn't default on the mortgage. If you actually look at the interest that's being manipulated, and let's use the word where it should be. It's theft. Section 6 of the Criminal Justice Act, our banks are currently stealing from their, their lenders, sorry, from the borrowers. Now, if you steal in this country, you should be in Mountjoy Prison. You shouldn't, now I'm sure if I went down to Mountjoy Prison today and said, I'll put you into the, into the inquiry, and if you apologise just like Richie Boucher did, or Sean Fitzpatrick, we'll let you off. No, that doesn't happen. If you do a crime, you pay the time. And the reality is, is that the p- borrowers of this country were duped. The book Waiting for the Sheriff has exposed for the first time the truth behind the criminal actions of our banking institutions. Are there multiple cases waiting before the courts? Are evictions happening today, tomorrow, before Christmas? Is this a reality? Because we don't hear about it. It's not in the papers. It's not on radio. It's not on television. So most people think, well, it's not happening anymore. It's gone away. The reality is that there's approximately 12,000 uh, possession orders being sought before the courts. We have, I can give you lists. At this minute in time. At this minute in time. And the reality is, is why? Because the bank wants the asset. Why did they want the asset? Because they can claim a capital loss for all the money that they don't own are no longer exposed. And what happens to the person who done nothing wrong? They're castigated onto the streets of Dublin, on the streets of Drogheda, the streets across Ireland. For what? To be put into a hotel paid by taxpayers' money when it would be so easy to stop this. Look at what's going to happen psychologically to those children. You mentioned about the struggle it is for a lot of people. I'm sure the people listening today uh, who are in dire circumstances as well. And to cope with this mentally is a huge, huge strain. Now, you've been through the mill. I mentioned it at the beginning there. How many court appearances now at this stage? I'm over 79 cases. You're still in your home? Yes. Even though they've tried to shift you out? Yes. On a number of occasions. They have done absolutely everything possible. I won't be shocked, and I'll ask your listeners if they want assistance or help, you can contact me at waitingfortheSheriff at gmail.com, um, wait, www.waitingfortheSheriff.com. Um, you can get in contact with, there's numerous groups and agencies. There is no reason why any person, because of what the bank's done, and remember, up to this moment as I'm speaking, the issue of the bank selling on their loans, it's called securitization or fractional reserve lending, or the issue of insurance, and we explained about the watch, has never been raised in the courts of Ireland. Yet, it was raised two years ago in an African court, the same jurisdiction as Ireland, ironically, and the judge actually said that securitization should have been criminalised. The fearing factor here is, or the worrying factor is, is that it's still happening today. The banks are still back securitizing loans. They haven't changed their policy. They're back at it again with no regulation. Ireland was deemed as one of the most questionable lending institutions in the world, yet we implemented no legislation. If this was an issue about abuse, every woman and child in this country would have so much legislation, ring fence to protect them. We have no legislation implemented. What we have is a personal insolvency uh, bill that came in uh, to protect the banks, to give the banks veto. All the legislation that was brought in, or or voluntary legislation, it wasn't mandatory, is for the banks to veto the very victims that they created. How ironic would it be that somebody could abuse somebody and then go back and legally abuse them again and have the sanction of 90 TDs to do it? 
How in God's name could any man or woman who say they represent the people endorse and stand while the courts all over this country tomorrow, the next day and the day after, will actually be evicting families before Christmas? I want to come back to your own case. I mentioned you're still in your home and I I do mention that if any of the people mentioned the TDs there want to counteract what Tom says, you're quite welcome to come on and do so. Um, For you, this battle has been long and seemingly never ending. Do you believe that it will come to an end and at the end of the day you'll be vindicated? I'm already vindicated because the information that I've put in the book... um, is open for any bank, uh, any financial institution, any individual that I've named and shamed to come after me for libel. But not one person in the five years of the litigation, and the men- I've mentioned this publicly on all the, the social media sites, I've mentioned it in public forums, I've identified the criminality perpetrated by individuals and groups and associations and committees, and not one of them have had the, the goal And I say goal rather than say the legal prowess to do it because they know what they've done. All they thought about was that this would never come out in the wash. Will you achieve a time and a day when you'll be sorted financially, that your financial situation will be sorted, that Tom Darcy can go back to his life? Again, um, I probably would have thinking two, three years ago or two and a half years ago when we last spoke that that would be possible. But... Sadly, because of the amount of people, and I mean over eight and a half thousand on my laptop, um, and you're looking, I'm not very computer um, literate, but when you see in the, in the, the body of a, an email where someone's saying that their child has leukemia or the husband has cancer and we're being evicted, there is no system in this country voluntary to pay for any solicitors or barristers for a civil case in this country. So you have people right now presenting themselves in court against the best legal minds in Ireland who were receiving 20 to 30,000 euros for that day, uh, paid by the taxpayers, up against a poor woman who has no children or a man that has no education and law. We have to change that system. It's called inequality, unjustness and unfairness. Ironically, Article 40 of our Constitution guarantees us that won't happen, but it's happening today. Peter says, worse still, Michael D. Higgins, the president, signed that bill into law. And uh, (laughs) Peter's in tune with you there on that one. And you do mention that in the book, I know as well. What I don't mention is the fact that I actually took out, I committed treason according to our constitution when all our 90 TDs voted in favour of the bill. I thought I would take out an interlocutory injunction against our president and I served him up in Arstenukteron, which is an unusual thing to do to a sitting president. I considered that A, the media would take note and it would be reported forcing our president to refer it back to his state's council. Now, It's called the Land and Conveyancing Law Reform Bill. But what it actually says in the bill is is that, one, you are not entitled to a plenary hearing. In other words, you're not entitled to a trial. Uh, In our constitution, it says you are. Number two, it also says that we're introducing retroactive law. So that basically means that I'm going to go into West Street in Drogheda. I'm going to remove the, 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 speeding lim- the speed limit and put it back to, uh, let's say, 20 miles an hour at Christmas. And every person that broke that speed limit, I'm now going to find them. That's the, the reality of this law. They want to go back in time to, again to facilitate the banks to facilitate what the banks want to do. You cannot implement a law that goes back in time. Tom Darcy, I have to leave it there for today. The book is called Waiting for the Sheriff by Tom Darcy. I've read the book myself. It's thought-provoking. It's sad. It makes you mad. It has all, really, of the emotions, the full gambit in the pages here. We have six copies to give away on late lunch this afternoon. If you'd like to read this book, perhaps you're in a situation that you can attest to what we've spoken about for the last while. Well, text me now. 53958 is the text number for Tom's book. Just tell me why you want this book. We'll send it out to six people before the end of the show. 53958 with your name and details for Tom's book. Text Tom's book to that number. For the moment, Tom Darcy, thank you.